Congratulate UMT for putting this uh, together and um, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's always uh, for me personally very energizing to see young people. Uh, you are the future of this country um, and uh, people in educational institutions particularly are, um, you know, I have a bias towards I teach whenever I get an opportunity to and I find there is a lot of learning for me to be done when I interact with um, youngsters. Um, I was asked to speak on um, uh, diversity in conflict management um, and the speaker, um, honorable speaker who came here to the dais before me, I think the topic that he, um, uh, you know, very uh, lucidly spoke about a uh, very critical topic, one close to my heart, but I cannot claim to be an expert on it. Um, uh, gender inequality, a global phenomena, um, increasing realization, and obviously in Pakistan, as the Honorable Speaker was mentioning, I think the statistics speak for, uh, for um, uh, itself and for the issues that we uh, confront, obviously, um, women having a voice, women having education, basic amenities, um, structures of representations, platforms for representations, um, their, uh, their representation in power structures, all of that is, uh, you know, only obvious um, and very critical. And where, you know, depending on whichever organization one is in, this is, one of the things that I always um, highlight and we make sure that within the management structure it's taken up is that women must have a voice. I think that um, I don't want to uh, go too much into detail because as I said, I was asked to speak on diversity and conflict um, in conflict management and I'll switch to that. But um, Dr. Salman Shah is here, um, a former finance minister and advisor to the current government. Uh, he on economic affairs and financial matters and so on. And I guess uh, people like him also have a very important role to play. And I think all sections of society have an important role to play when it comes to um, issues of women's rights and um, equality guaranteed in the constitution of Pakistan. And, um, and uh, very correctly, the honorable speaker uh, talked about um, the examples in our uh, own um, uh, culture, tradition, and indeed religion from Hazrat Khatija to Hazrat Aisha to Bibi Fatima and certainly Bibi Zainab. I mean, if you need to ever uh, talk of an icon, uh, you know, for a lifetime in terms of speaking up for um, rights and, and, and not just women's rights, but speaking up for... Um, uh, for uh, uh, for principles, for speaking truth to power, etc., Karbala and following that uh, Bibi Zainab's role. So anyway, let me switch now uh, to my subject. Mm, uh, mm, I was asked, as I said, to speak on diversity in conflict management. Uh, so diversity, um, uh, you know, when you look at our own country, you look at uh, diversity at multiple levels, obviously. There's gender diversity, but I'm putting that on the side because when we obviously we just spoke about it, and that's something that cuts across all uh, all other uh, uh, divides, etc. Uh, but when we talk about diversity in conflict management, we are obviously looking at um, you know how a society is managed, how a society functions, how those who run a society. Uh, elected people, state institutions, and above all, the constitution, um, which basically, um, you know, is the fountainhead from which all rest flows. Um, it has to, uh, its, its role essentially is to um, provide good governance and to address um, issues and concerns of all of the entire society. Diversity emerges 
as a factor um, uh, and uh, first as a general factor and then as a divisive factor. Diversity as a divisive factor emerges in the context of crisis of governance. The, the greater the problems with governance, the greater the problems with um, delivery of services, of amenities, of basic rights and facilities that are guaranteed in constitutions like our constitution, um, uh, the greater the um, uh, inability of uh, those who run the affairs of the state, the greater the inability to provide the services that and, and rights, etc., to the entire society, the greater diversity will emerge. That's a basic formula that works in every every society, every part of the world. So let's be clear that diversity in and of itself does not create conflict. Di I mean, uh, I was just looking at a few examples, uh, uh, starting from Pakistan itself. Um, uh, so if you look at um, what, what we experienced in the, you know, immediately after the creation uh, issues of, you know, there were language riots, there were other issues that emerged, political representation, etc. So wherever there, and, and when these kinds of issues emerge, they will then obviously give rise to diversity as a divisive for, force, whether on the basis of ethnicity, whether on the basis of um, regional divide, whether on the basis of, um, you know, professional groups in society and so on and so forth. So in Pakistan, um, or whether, uh, you know, uh, ideological divides, there is one diverse entity in democratic societies, which is, uh, which is a positive, which is a given, which, uh, which is political divide. You know, uh, poli uh, political parties inherently give diverse and different identities to their followers, but that, that competition, that diversity is not a diversity uh, which should lead to conflict. It is not a diversity that will lead to um, uh, challenges to the state. Uh, the kind of diversity that leads to challenges to the state and one that can, one that creates problems. Um, uh, for example, you know, as I was driving, I just drove in from Islamabad. On the way, I was looking at the papers, etc. Let me pick up uh, an example um, of PTM, Pashtun Tahfuz Mahaz. So, if we were to see how this started, you know, we can come to where we stand today, but. So, um, with terrorism uh, that hits Pakistani society and much more northern areas and, um, you know, the tribal areas, sorry, not tribal, North Waziristan, etc., the tribal areas. Um, when uh, conflict, when terrorism hit the, these areas, obviously the state had to step in to roll back these um, terrorists. And while the state was doing that, it had to do it. Um, you had um, uh, operations like Zarbeas, etc. And uh, an inevitable part of such operations anywhere in the world will be destruction of homes, of markets, etc. That, that's something that uh, is almost unavoidable. However, after that, um, uh, you know, the institutions, government, state, etc., decided that those who lost, uh, you know, got financially hit, uh, whether it was their houses being decimated or whether uh, markets, etc., they will get compensation. The compensation has been very slow, if at all, in coming, with the result that these groups, there was this group in 2014 called uh, Mesood Tahfuz Mahaz. So it's an economic uh, reason, a reason where they felt that a reason which uh, flowed from conflict, which flowed from a, you know, a problem that we all faced in this country and then an operation which had to be done. So you don't address the problem, you don't fulfill the promise of giving compensation, people will ge obviously get together and try and fight for their rights. So. Until Nakibullah Mesud, this guy Mesud uh, from the Mesud tribe, um, he was killed in extrajudicial killing. Obviously, it was a mistake, a mistake, mistaken identity. But Nakibullah Mesud in uh, January 2018 was killed in Karachi. 
and that became a trigger for other people um, uh, from the Mesut tribe to stand up and then that conflated, that joined together with the, um, uh, the Mesut Tahfuz Mahas and you had the uh, PTM emerge. So PTM, this, the, the roots of PTM were economic, they were standing up for something where they felt um, they had been wronged and what they wanted had not been delivered. And today it has, it snowballed into um, a more complicated problem and uh, yesterday um, Manzoor Pashtin was um, taken into custody because the Peshawar High Court said he had to be taken into custody because there were some speeches which were objectionable and, and while Article 19 gives you the right freedom of expression. It says very clearly within reasonable limits. Now, so a problem starts, it snowballs, uh, if it is not addressed, it snowballs into a greater problem and then you have an issue which you have today and the identity, the identity has, uh, you know, it's today seen as a movement the Pashtuns are leading because, and then the story becomes much broader and, you know, there are obviously degrees of exaggeration while we know that the integration of Khyber Pakhtun Khaf, formerly frontier of the Pashtuns, in the economy of Pakistan, the um, integration in terms of the economy, in terms of um, the power structure, in terms of politics, institutions, the integration is, is, is very much there. But if there are problems that are unresolved, then that integration emerges, the integration being there, you still have elements emerge as, uh, who take up the rallying cry of the same ethnic group. So Pashtuns, while they're economically, in the terms of power, etc., are very much integrated into Pakistan, into the Federation, uh, you know, within the decentralized mode of um, uh, governance that we have. But the fact that the compensation was not paid to these people and then the killing of this guy, um, extrajudicial killing, and the killer not brought to um, uh, task yet, uh, you know, justice has not been delivered. Uh, these things develop into uh, conflict. So it's not like that you have to um, manage, uh, how do you manage diversity in conflict? My submission would be, I would change the title into how do you, um, how does the state, how does good governance deliver to the entire society, deliver to diverse groups so that the conflict doesn't emerge? I mean, I can give you um, endless numbers of examples in terms of how um, how mismanagement has led to um, emergence of uh, you know diverse groups. Uh, in t but uh, you know, when I say that uh, diversity, whether ethnic or um, religious or any diversity, isn't inherently reason for conflict. It is not. I mean, there are so many societies. In, in Switzerland, there are 17 or 32 different little communities that coexist. But that is because the state is responding to the needs of these um, uh, diverse groups. So diversity there hasn't created conflict in those societies. It's easier said than done, but there is no other option. I mean, those who run the affairs of the state have to address um, the concerns, etc., of different groups. Um, in Pakistan, uh, uh, when uh, um, the military ruler, General Zia, late General Zaul Haq, he, um, he imposed, uh, you know, uh, different laws uh, and where women, um, it was contrary to the spirit of the constitution of Pakistan, then women came out. I mean, uh, where Women's Action Forum became active and so on and so forth. And then different groups emerged to, uh, you know, to basically say our rights have to be delivered. You have in society different, um, uh, you know, whether this is a business group, whether it's the lawyers, lawyers obviously over fight for their rights. A general comment, we could discuss that, but um, but in Balochistan, the problems that emerged, what happened in East Pakistan, um, and uh, you know, so when the state doesn't deliver, 
when the state doesn't deliver doesn't address issues you will number one conflict will be inevitable number two your adversaries external players will always come in to uh, take advantage in the i mean um, i found it uh, rather amusing that the afghan president who mr ashraf ghani who has to deal with uh, tons of stuff happening at home the chaos and crisis at home he tweeted for uh, for uh, pashtin manzoor pashtin and in his tweet he said we should be very concerned about um, societies where civil rights movements aren't um, uh, don't get the space to express the differences and when i went on his twitter timeline when i went down two or three tweets below he was singing uh, praises of uh, you know the worst kind of fascist that we are seeing on in asia if not globally right now that is mr modi i mean a fascist who is see what he's doing in kashmir see what he's doing to the people of kashmir he's the the brutality there and mr ashraf ghani who number one should be concerned about what's happening inside his own country but then he's um, praising singing praises of uh, this brutal um, fascist um, mr modi so obviously double standards there but um, because um, mr ashraf ghani has his own issues obviously and pakistan afghanistan have their own um, you know there's a baggage on both sides uh, the need in afghanistan one to uh, keep uh, keep uh, supporting pushing and speaking up officials i mean the president speaking up for manzoor pashtin that would be inevitable we can criticize it but they, obviously they will do this and then you know much worse much more uh, of an interference etc and then infiltrate extreme groups who can start attacking the army who can start um, you know being abusive and obviously there are certain red lines um, uh, anyway those are uh, matters of detail obviously the pakistan armed forces um, is an institution very honorable an institution we are proud of when they make wrong decisions we will stand up and say their decisions are wrong but the institution is a non rebel institution so anyway i just took up this example to explain that um, that you can in a situation which is otherwise uh, normal a conflict can arise because of <clears throat> and diversity will be flagged diversity becomes then a mobilizing cry okay the sindh card um, you know balochistan issue uh, south punjab mr khusro has now forgotten his uh, you know very um, <laughs> bombastic claims that he was making about creating a south punjab province but uh, you know that their diversity he used uh, for a, for a different purpose but diversity um, will will emerge in uh, in spaces where uh, where the where the state doesn't deliver where institutions don't deliver and um, let me just end by saying that this is not something that is um, easy by any means pakistan is a complex society and uh, pakistan has a complex history it's a soul which is a tormented soul whether wars or whether internal conflicts whether martial laws etc but that is not to say that you can um, still not uh, manage much much better and uh, finally um, uh, i think that uh, the digital age in the digital age uh, giving good governance on the one hand and managing expectations on the other hand without trying to muzzle voices without trying to go to facebook google etc and saying make up people you know let's see how we can control control dissent i think dissent um, within the parameters of the constitution of pakistan let me be very clear uh, dissent within the parameters of constitution of pakistan um, must be allowed and that gives a uh, voice to those whose voices if not heard can morph into um, di disasters for the state and we saw that happen um, in east pakistan and um, so finally i think that we are saying that um, that 
dissent must be given a voice and dissent within the constitutional parameters but when i <clears throat> when i speak about the constitutional parameters that um, that dissent and voices then then everybody has to play by that rule then the constitutional framework must apply and the discipline that the constitution demands of its citizens there is a discipline that the constitution demands from institutions from whether it's the parliament whether it is the judiciary whether it is the army everybody has to then play by the same rules and play by the rules of the constitution and um, and even so if everybody is playing by the rules the task of ensuring good governance is not easy at all but there is no other way uh, but but good governance if you want to ensure uh, minimization of conflict and as i said earlier there are external um, adversaries who will always come and uh, you know play up um, the internal conflicts that exist um and uh, and in in some cases like you saw kulbushan yadav etc you don't even need in turn conflicts you, there are those who come and play um, play up and create in turn conflicts and just on the concluding note you know india's uh, current national security advisor mr doval um, uh, he is it has now been removed from uh, google but on youtube there was a lecture he gave um, Uh, at the um, uh, mumbai uh, institute of management where he spoke in detail about when he was in pakistan sitting outside data darbar and gamesha as an agent and you know uh, he was disguised uh, himself as a as a fakir and he sat there and god knows what all he tried to plant in pakistani society then so so we not we, it's not an easy environment we are in regional environment all the more reason that we should the you know the governments institutions etc everybody should stri strive for good governance play within constitutional rules and i think on this i'll end and the best man to speak on challenges of good governance is uh, dr salman shah sab anyway over to the organizers thank you, thank you.